Cause it's a big change The 180 Your life will be the same The 180 Say yes to your beautiful future um, I am so, so, so thrilled and excited to have Chef Jose Garces here. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> What's up, man? And I'm, I'm thrilled that you have an exclusive for us. You got something that nobody else has, and we got it now, and we're going to share it with the world. Um, I'm really honored to have you here. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm, uh, I'm excited to be here feeling good uh did my five mile exercise walk i've been doing Ooh. i've been doing that during the time oh yeah i've been get, been getting it in i'm i'm uh based in philly i'm in this little neighborhood called maniunk and there's a there's a beautiful like park nearby here called wisdom to hicken valley mm. um, and uh yeah get my i get my steps in every day so i'm i'm feeling good accomplished so already. five miles before noon you've Oh, five miles before, usually 9 a.m. Before 9, 9 a.m. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. Early bird gets the warm, man. We get started early over here. I love that. That's, there you go. That's, that's a, that's a message. message for you. So, <laughs> <laughs> folks, let's, let's get started uh, waking up early and getting a walk and an exercise and doing all that good stuff. Um, so, I'm going to intro you, let folks know a little bit more about you. Uh, Iron Chef, father, husband, James Beard Award winner, entrepreneur, and food innovator chef Jose Garces is known as a leading culinary authority of Spanish and Latin American food. From the Spanish tapas at Amada, his first restaurant, to the playful Japanese street food at Okche in Atlantic City, Chef Garces continually pushes the boundaries of culinary excellence. While he maintains his successful career owning and operating full service restaurants, Chef Garces is also looking toward the future with an increased focus on bringing restaurant quality experiences to the homes and businesses of culinary enthusiasts in new and interesting ways. From enhanced home delivery options and virtual online cooking demos to live online cooking classes, Chef Garces is excited to connect with both fans of his work on television, as well as the home cook who'd like to experience chef life in their own kitchen. As a child of immigrants and a leader in the diverse and inclusive hospitality industry, the well-being of his community in Philadelphia has always been dear to Chef Garces' heart. To help provide ongoing and actionable assistance to the immigrant community, Chef Garces co-founded the Garces Foundation in 2011. The Garces Foundation provides services, including community health days, English language skills classes that target the restaurant industry, and most recently, an increased focus on securing and providing food supplies to the food insecure. Chef Garces, Chef Garces is the author of two cookbooks, Latin Evolution and The Latin Road Home, published by Lake Isle Press. And I'm just thrilled to have you here, brother, and to, to learn more about cooking, because I'm, I'm not great at it. <laughs> I'm not great at it, but I admire you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And I think, you know, even though um, we've I've had restaurants for many years, I've always felt like it's important. You know, I want everyone to come in and eat our food and, you know, and mm -hmm. it's, it's important to learn how to, how to make make some delicious meals at home, you know, because that's especially now more than ever. Right. So, uh, yes, got to get, we got to get you, get you going, get some, you know, get some, some skills in some basics. Uh-huh. I, I appreciate that. Cause you know, um, <laughs> I, I do every once in a while I use HelloFresh and I appreciate HelloFresh because just having the instructions, but you know, what? I need to get one of your cookbooks and maybe, maybe one personal like coaching session, maybe one coaching session will help me out. Perfect. Perfect. I got a better one for you. So we're launching yeah. and we'll, we'll get into it. It's uh -huh. called Lat Live. And through my, through my site, you'll be able to sign up and come cook with me live. You'll, I'll give you the recipe ahead Ooh. of time. We'll be able to do things together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. So we'll be, so our listeners, audiences, people from all over the world can cook with you. Absolutely. Yeah. You'll be able to go to, uh, go to chefgarces.com. And, um, and there you'll find a button that says Latin live and I'll do probably about two to three classes a month. So we have our nice. first two classes coming up in January and yeah, sign up. You'll have to be able to ask questions. We'll be able to like walk through all things that are Latin. And, you know, I think that's that my focus is to, has always been for years to teach people about Latin food, mm -hmm. uh, 
through our culture, we teach people about Latin culture through food. And it's been, it's been a great experience for me throughout. Awesome. Well, I'm going to tell you, I will be there in January and I invite the listeners to join me and you as I, as I can get some lessons in cooking because I need them. <laughs> awesome. Ha happy to do it. Yes. Well, uh, on the 180, we always play some games. So I'm excited about this game time moment that we're about to have. Uh, right. We're, we're going to call this, iron this out. Okay. So, so most of us have been quarantining, or all of us pretty much, have been quarantining. And meals can be everything from takeout from your local restaurant, which absolutely, folks, support your local businesses. Or sometimes it's whatever we have lying around the kitchen. And... Um, for me personally, my, my kitchen looks more like a chef's nightmare than a chef's dream. Um, so we're going to throw some random quarantine ingredients at you and ask how you might be able to iron out a tasty meal from the ingredients. Gotcha. Uh, Got it. Got it. It's like right in my wheelhouse. I love it. Good, good, good. I, th I thought good. you might like this. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the first thing we've got, we're going to start off easy. So chicken flavored top ramen. How would you iron that out? Make it something a little more special. What? You got me. I'm, 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 that's my, that's my, that's my jam right there. You yeah. Have no idea. All right. So here you go. You got, you got the, the top ramen, right? And it has uh -huh. the little chicken flavor in there. Mm -hmm. So in my pantry, I always have chicken broth because, oh. I, because I cook, you know, it's, I think it's a staple, right? So it's chicken broth. So what I would do is, do 50% water, 50% mm -hmm. chicken, chicken broth, and then add that flavoring in there. And that broth and that liquid is going to be pretty good. Now you could add a few, a little more seasoning to it. Uh -huh. if, you, if you like it a little, little spicy, a little like red pepper flake, right? Yes, yeah, perfect. So now you have uh -huh. this broth kind of going, right? And then I go in my veg drawer and I'm like, okay, I've got broccoli, I've got carrots, maybe I've got some asparagus. Mm -hmm. Chop those up into little fine pieces right at the end, like maybe like two minutes before you're done, you drop those in. So they steam okay. and I'll also drop in right into that broth. I'll, I'll crack an egg and put an egg right into it. Ah. Right? right. So now I got a little more protein. Mm -hmm. uh, then I'll drop my, my, my ramen, my ramen noodles in there. And then when it comes out, it'll be steaming hot. I have veggies. I have additional protein from my egg. And then what I might do is um, I might slice like a half an avocado on there Ooh. and maybe, some, and maybe some chopped cilantro. And yes. Boom, you're, you got a little spicy, you've got some yes. savory notes, you've got the protein, you got it all. You got a meal. This, right? you definitely ironed that up. Like that's, that's, because that sounds so good now, and especially, I love cilantro. I know some people like cilantro is, they have this weird thing where cilantro, they can't stand the taste. I love cilantro, so. There are cilantro lovers and cilantro haters. And <laughs> right. you and I, my friend, we're in the lover department. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next, next thing. Um, and this is slightly fictional because I don't eat meat, but you know, it, so it sounds right for the storytelling. Tinned corned beef in half a tube of tomato paste. All right, so tinned corned beef. So, uh -huh. so stuff you buy in a can and yeah. half a tube of tomato paste. Okay, all right, That's, that is definitely a challenge. But yeah. I would, here's what I would do. I would treat that corned beef like ground beef, right? Mm. And I would make like, um, and I, I would make like bolognese out of it. Okay. So again, so you have tomato paste, you've got what is like kind of ground beef. So all you would need to do is maybe a little onion, a little garlic, um, mm -hmm. saute that down, add that tin corned beef in there, kind of make it like a scramble. Like you would, you know, bolognese is like ground beef. It's like a little, little specks of beef. Mm -hmm. And you add your tomato paste. You would add, um, you know, if you had, if you had broth, you could add beef broth to it. If not, you could add, um, just a water or veg stock. It's gonna okay. make a sauce, right? We'll make it yeah, yeah. And then uh, whatever pasta of your choice that you have. Exactly. Yeah, and you, boom, fresh Parmesan. You have corned beef bolognese <laughs> with, you know, your pasta of your choice and a little Parmesan and you're, okay. you're there. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I wanted to press ding multiple times. Okay, 
Um, all right. Was, well, this this is yeah. this one is tricky. I don't know. You know, we'll see. You, this is really gonna create. Uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna figure this out. A stale ba baguette, stale baguette, sardines and limes. Oh, okay. Sardines, a stale baguette and limes. Okay, yeah. okay. Stale baguette. Uh, oh, I love it. Okay, I got it. So a key component in, and I don't know if you've had this, Eric, uh, gazpacho is a Spanish soup, right? It's a, mm -hmm. uh, so. Yeah, I, I've had gazpacho. I love it, but yeah, but I, okay, so, I love hearing so, the description of it. So the thickening agent is a stale baguette. That's usually the thickening agent. And so mm. uh, it this requires a few more ingredients. So tomatoes, cucumbers, that stale baguette, usually sherry vinegar, but any vinegar that you want and good quality olive oil, all mm. those things into a blender. That's what makes your gazpacho. So it, and, and I've had it, I yeah, worked in Spain, typically in Spain, they, they drink it. It's so kind of loose, mm. uh, but you can make it, you know, here, here in the U S sometimes a little thicker. I like it somewhere in between. So once you have your gazpacho with that stale baguette, the sardines, that's a perfect, that's a perfect accompaniment to a gazpacho. You probably take them uh -huh. up, cut them up into little pieces, just put them in there like a garnish. So you have this like chilled tomato soup with chunk chunks of sardines. I actually really love that. I might I might use that in my restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> if so, you know, the 180 provided the idea. <laughs> There you go. There you go. It I can might, be called the 180, or or you can use my name, the Eric, the you know Eric Lockley. I don't know. I might even call it, yeah, hey, all right. Listen, I like I like the 180 for the soup. Yeah. Sandwich for the Eric. All right, something a little more. True. You know, yes. Yeah, a little more hearty. Yeah, a little more hearty. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. A uh, last one. Oh, this is this is you know it's getting more difficult. Okay. But you're but you're figuring it out. You're figuring it out. All right. So, beef hot dogs. Frozen naan, Greek yogurt, and capers. Oh, okay. Yeah. Frozen naan, beef hot dogs. Well, frozen naan, you're gonna pull out and you're gonna you're gonna defrost it. Right. That's easy. You do right. That. Um, so the beef hot dogs, easy enough. I mean, I'm gonna make um uh i'm just gonna grill them i'm gonna char them and i get them real like it creates some texture on the outside a hot hot skillet hot cast iron cast mm -hmm. iron with the yogurt i'm gonna make a uh cucumber uh kind of almost like a tzatziki of sorts so okay. yogurt i'll put some of those capers in there i'll put a little cucumber a little olive oil some herb usually it usually it's dill but whatever parsley mint chive so I'll make a cucumber tzatziki. Mm -hmm. I'll char those dogs. Um, you know, I might even shave a little red onion on it. But you know what? I'm I'm having basically a Greek, like, like a, a a hot dog Greek gyro, like uh -huh. right there. <laughs> and I'm actually I'm actually feeling really good about that. I'm I'm gonna enjoy that. That might be a late night like a late night deal. Like oh, this is all I got. I, right. I it, Now, did yeah. you did you incorporate the capers? I just, I don't know if I capers heard about the capers. The, the capers are in the tzatziki. Okay. So top okay. capers, because you need a little of that brininess. Uh -huh. So cucumbers, capers, yogurt. If you have herbs, throw it in there, a little olive oil. That's your sauce for that charred dog. That sounds really good. Somehow you <laughs> ironed that out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, well, thank you so much. It was, uh, I mean, you, you killed that game, honestly. My, my, listen, listen, I, um, during, during cooking school, I had, uh, several roommates and, and while we were, we had several late nights, as you could imagine, uh -huh. uh, <laughs> you know, that, that game actually was played pretty much every night. Hey, this is uh -huh. what we got. <laughs> Jose, you're, you're learning how to become a chef, make it happen. So, uh, yeah, I've got good practice with that. Nice. Yeah. I guess all eyes turn to you when it was like, all right, so what, what can we make with this? What do we got with this? Yeah. <laughs> right. Hot dogs, sardine. Yeah. <laughs> just random shit. Um, great. Well, now I'm going to ask you some more questions that are a little more about getting to know you um, that are kind of random at the same time. So do you have a favorite song or genre of music to cook to? Oh, 
Oh yeah, I do. Um, I don't know. I, it really depends on the mood and I'm, I'm loving, uh, I'm loving lately that, um, my my kitchen is is near kind of uh, where my my TV is, so I have mm-hmm. been having YouTube up and have been listening to the NPR Tiny House or Tiny Tiny Desk. Oh yeah, yeah. Stuff. And they have all these you know great artists that are on there doing like kind of home shows or yeah. It, it's it's been really cool to watch. So I have a wide a wide spectrum of of music, but um, you know I can do anything from hip hop uh, to like you know I have. Um, on my site, actually, I have the Tribe Call Quest, call it a uh, playlist that I have nice. various artists around kind of in, are in that genre. But I also like, uh, I like good Latin jazz. I love okay. a good, like um, a, guy, a guy named Pancho Sanchez. Makes okay, yes, like Pancho that. Sanchez, yes. Yeah, he's a great uh, conguero. Like, yeah, he plays great, great bongos. And mm-hmm. so I, I love that vibe. I also love... Um, I've been into like the dub essentials. So kind of the, uh, okay. Right. Yeah. Hey, Aha, you know, little dub. <laughs> yeah. so it really, it really varies, but, uh, I do think, you know, music is such a big part of cooking. It's like, they go mm-hmm. kind of hand in hand. It's a nice way to relax on wine. So, yeah. Absolutely. When, whenever I'm cooking, I, uh, when, when my HelloFresh box comes <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I got to do this. I have all the instructions. I have everything I need. Um, I end up playing like 90s R&B because that's my favorite genre, but I'm like in there singing Usher and <laughs> and taking a lot more time than I should because I just have to break out and do a dance during the chorus. Um, yeah, so, yeah. you know, cooking, you got to enjoy it. It's mm-hmm. got to be fun. You got to make it. It can't be laborious or painful. Like it, it has to feel good. And uh, I actually do a lot of cooking with my wife. So she, we, we have a plan usually every morning. That's part of our early morning routine. All right, what's the dinner plan? What do we got going on? Who's prepping yeah. what? What provisions do we have to get? And by doing it collectively, you know, the, the kind of the, the like grunt work or the hard work that's usually right. involved in cooking is taken out. And then we're able to really connect enjoy i'll have i might have a i might have a drink kind of a cocktail as i'm making i put my music on yeah it's freaking it's awesome yeah it's just a whole it's vibe time. with cooking it's like yeah make cooking fun like you said make cooking fun it ha- no it ha- it has to be you know yeah. like, like with everything in life like you i'm i'm looking for ways to enjoy every aspect of it and since cooking is such a big part of my life it's on a high level of like fig- figuring it out mm-hmm um, what was your favorite game to play as a kid? Favorite game to play? Uh, yeah. Probably, uh, I think wiffle ball was like a fun, like a fun thing to play uh-huh. until my older brother and I got into a uh, pretty heated, heated uh, disagreement about like who was safe and who was out. <laughs> <laughs> now, so. now I'm good. I need you to describe what wiffle ball is because in my mind I have one idea but I feel like as kids we play things and we give them their own names and so you know a person from Philly may think dodgeball is a different thing than someone from yeah. <laughs> from Baltimore maybe I don't know yeah no wiffle ball is a yellow plastic bat and a white uh plastic ball and you play it just like baseball okay. however it's not like a hard ball it's a light ball and you have you don't need you know, 20 players to play, you can play with like four people. Okay. And okay. I grew up in Chicago and we had, you know, a lot of the streets in Chicago, uh, well, like many, they, they have the four corners, you have sewer caps at every corner. So those are, <laughs> and uh, yeah, you just get, get like a serious game going, you know, back, back then. I remember that was like, you know, the late seventies, early eighties. Uh-huh we're talking about here so you know i'm a, <laughs> that's where i'm at with things <laughs> yeah. and so um you know playing a game of like call it like kind of like mock baseball where uh-huh. baseball was actually like a was such a big part of our like sports uh scene it, you know there, there weren't as many options let's say as there are now uh, right, athletic. Right. So it was like you know we were like big cubs fans and so mm. we uh you know played played it and played it played our hearts out with it so yeah that's a, definitely a childhood memory a game yeah. memory that I, I won't forget and when i whenever i hear the cubs i think the cubs uh, the cubs the cubs 
the Bulls, <laughs> the Bears, yeah. The Bears, the Cubs, yeah. I don't know. Why. Um, if you could instantly be an expert at something, what would you choose? Oh, gosh. Right now, I'd love to be uh, an expert at, uh, gosh, epidemiology. I'd love to, you know, yeah. Yes. I'd love to, like, you know, figure figure this stuff out and help yeah. give give assistance where I could because I obviously the scientists are doing um, doing amazing work right now and really valued work. So that would be my uh, wish. I would have you know, picked that picked that skill up too. Yeah. Then I mean, you would be. Well, ideally, you would be getting paid well right now, but you also would at least be able to like have a better sense of like, how, what is really going on? How can I help? How can we help each other? Because, yeah. Yeah, no, it's obviously, it's a, it's a crazy time. And I think, you know, one that uh, we certainly didn't see coming. Uh, yeah. at least, you know, the, and so I think um, getting, getting to understand that, you know, what's, what's been happening and what, and how to help would, you know, would be really helpful at this point. Mm -hmm. Now, um, your journey and becoming a chef has been so interesting and uh, being able to have moments televised and publicized and all that stuff can be a lot. Uh, but what is a moment, describe for us a moment when you knew that you were meant to be a chef. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, there was, so my journey really, uh, it started in my, in my mom's kitchen uh, with my grandma and my mom, they were both like like really good cooks. They had like really good palates and they could cook things like to the right temperature and everything always tasted really good in their in their homes. But we were not we were not like a restaurant family or a hospitality family. It wasn't like in the in the blood. It was just more of like like really good cooks. Mm -hmm. So um, when I decided to go to uh, cooking school it was more based around uh, the foundation of structure and kind of, uh, I, I grew up playing football and wrestled and realized that that kind of like structured environment was one that I excelled in. Mm. So when I went to cooking school and saw everybody in like white uniforms and tall hats and like the structure, it just it kind of fell in line with me. And I didn't know that I knew I loved food. I was like, you know, always a chubby kid and like enjoyed <laughs> eating, but um uh, Never didn't know that I had the cooking chops. It was very, it was kind of experimental, it was an exploration. Mm -hmm. And um, what I realized, and I didn't, you know, again, I didn't know I had the talent was as we were given projects as, as like uh, cooking students, cooking school students, we were given projects to create dishes. And, you know, we would get like, call it like a mystery basket, like here's like five ingredients, go at it, mm -hmm. guys, and see what you could do. And I found that it just piqued my, my creative, like touched this like creative part. And as the year went on, I saw that I was like outshining a lot of my classmates and it just <laughs> felt like really natural to me. So that was a moment where I was like, wow, I actually like, I like an undiscovered talent. Like I didn't even know I had that. And so I found it and I'm like, okay, I'm going to like, I'm going to take this and go with it. Nice. And uh, who was someone along your journey that, that you discovered was in your corner that you didn't expect? Someone that was in your corner that you didn't expect to be? Oh, gosh. Someone that was in my corner. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I would say, you know, I think in my, in my culinary career, um, someone who I came across who ended up ended up becoming we'll call it a mentor or, mm -hmm. or you know, a true like friend who I didn't I didn't see coming right he was um so a, a chef named uh Douglas Rodriguez uh, mm -hmm. a close friend so I had been cooking in New York for about four years actually about three and a half years after after being in after cooking in Spain and again you know part of the cooking industry part of the chef industry is certainly not glamorous, especially <laughs> early on. Especially early, early on, you're really like, you're in many ways a grunt and you're yeah. just like, you're grinding it out, right? You're preparing meals, you're prepping things. 
there isn't all like the accolades and the TV stuff that doesn't yeah, people, happen. People are just like, get me the uh, ingredient. Just yeah, do it go, as fast go, as you can. Go get me the cilantro, uh -huh. hurry your ass up, chop it and like, uh -huh. let's go, you know? And so um, even I'll give you guys a funny story. I, um, I don't want to digress too far, but I was in, when I was cooking in Spain, one of the chefs, I had a late night. I had a really like people partied there in Spain. Mm -hmm. yes. the news. They partied late. So I came in the next day. I looked, I probably looked like, you know, looked like crap. This guy, he looked knew. like last night. <laughs> I looked like last night. Yeah. And so um, he grabs me this bucket, the chef, his name was uh, Capi or Capitan. Mm -hmm. uh, and he had grabs this bucket and it's filled with these little tiny fish. They're called chanquetes. And they're all like, there's probably like a thousand of them, right? And they're oh swimming, gosh. they're swimming in this bucket, right? They're live. Uh -huh. And he's like, grab the, he grabs the fish and he's like, okay, I want you to take each one of these guys and just kind of clean the back end with a knife, right? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so obviously he was messing with me, but I didn't realize it at the time. And it was like a very serious kitchen. Uh -huh. So and I'll never forget that because I was I was pretty upset because I wasn't feeling good. And now I'm in here like kind of swirt looking for these, trying to catch these fish and like these tiny and fish so, yeah. and cut them open, right? Cut them open. So and then everyone's like laughing. I'm like, okay, this is this is fun. <laughs> so yeah, so that you know that's like that. And again, I mean, I think it it was an experience, but growing up. In, in, in learning to become a chef and getting to these, like this kind of like higher level of cooking, you have to put your time in. And I was in New York for about uh, three years. I actually um, was thinking about leaving. I was thinking about going back to Chicago or possibly uh, moving down to Florida. You know, it, as chefs, we're, man, we're, we are, can be vagabonds from time mm -hmm. to time. Transition from job to job, move around. So anyway, um, I met my friend, uh, a, a famous chef. His name's D Douglas Rodriguez. He was known as the the godfather of Nuevo Latino cuisine. Hey. And so I met him in New York and he was like, um, I, I had actually just left the position I was in. He said, hey, Jose, why don't you come and work, work with me? And I, um, because he was higher up on the, on the kind of like totem pole and I was just transitioning, I was, going from a salary position to an hourly position, right? And he mm. was like, okay, you gotta, you gotta take a step back, but then, you know, prove yourself, right? So I took a step back to really take a step forward. And it's been a good, yeah. like, it's, it's helped me in life, that, that point. And so he was a great mentor from a flavor perspective, from mm. like a culinary perspective, just an amazing talent as it relates to food and ingredients and he just had this like ability to recreate anything so he was um a, a, a huge uh influence in my cooking career and I, and I ended up working with him for about seven years wow yeah and, and I, I always think it's interesting because along our journeys both uh career-wise and personally sometimes we don't realize the folks that are in our corner and um, not until there's not until afterwards do we say, "Wow, I didn't, I didn't know," or do we realize that people are speaking our names in rooms that we have no idea about, um, and we don't find out until later on. But um, making sure that we express gratitude and recognize that that's that can be a blessing um, that you didn't expect. So that's really really awesome. Yeah, I th I think Eric, a lot of you'll find that, you know, I'm, I'm 48 years old. I've been doing, been in the industry, I've been, been around. You'll find that, and, and I've found that, you know, people come, have come in and out of my career, in and out of my life. And there are, there are just certain times and certain people where you know there's like, um, as you reflect, there is like a, an element of like being, of being genuine, of mm -hmm. being, you know, truly, sincere and really wanting the best for you and that that doesn't always occur yeah. uh but i can certainly look back and and point out a handful of those experiences for sure mm. um so now let's get into the 180 for you uh, a yeah. moment when you know you've been going in one direction and you're ready to turn things around it sounds like we might be at that moment right now for you is that right yeah man it is it is um 
it really, you know, I think with, with COVID and everything kind of happening to the restaurant industry, mm-hmm. um, I felt like I was already heading towards this pivotal move. And so, um, you know, I, I started the, the restaurant group in 2005 and um, ended up selling in 2018, but staying on board as like mm-hmm. a founder, a, a partner, and still very interested in, in restaurants. And, you know, the company has several disciplines, uh, restaurants, catering and events, um, you know, a lot of things as it related to the restaurant business. But for a long time, I felt like, you know, it would be great to focus on kind of some of the personal brand things, as well Mm -hmm. as other things that are uh, encompassed in this great, like, food and beverage industry that we have. And so uh, with COVID and things kind of slowing down on the restaurant side, it really gave me an opportunity to pivot and Mm -hmm. really focus on these other aspects. And some of them are are really great. They're fun. They're things I've I've wanted to do. Uh, So uh, I've been into uh, retail product development. So really taking what we do in the restaurants, right? The the techniques, the ingredients, the recipes, all these things that we've, I've been working with for many years. I have over 2000 recipes in my database. Wow. Oh, that's so cool. That is, that's amazing. So and so yep. they thus far they've been in the restaurants, you know, in the in the kitchen for the restaurants, and now you're talking uh-huh. about bringing some of those bringing some of those out into the retail space. Awesome. So looking at the different retail environments and 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 you know I think now is is a perfect time because people are cooking at home more, mm-hmm. right? So that so so getting into that, I've got like a number of. Uh, products that I would say are called under development, but that's a big focus for me right now. Um, then um, video, video content and just call it like content production. So uh, mm-hmm. we filmed, we filmed this year, 24, eight minute, eight to nine minute videos, call it cooking videos. It's called, uh, it's called cooking space. Okay. And so cooking space. cooking space. So this is a place where mindfulness and being present meets food and music so all three i disciplines. love this <laughs> yes this sounds very yeah. up the like in line with the 180 yes let's that's go. it yes. yeah yeah so um i um you know basically being mindful and being present that's a mm-hmm. big part of kind of my my day to day so we We talked about my five mile walk. Right. Most of that is just checking in with myself and checking in Mm. with my body, my mind, making sure, hey, I'm ready to tackle this day. And from a from a place of calm. So I apply that to the kitchen because I think Mm. the kitchen is also a place where you got to come in and you can, you know, with everything going on in the environment outside, like it's a place where you can control that space. You can like have it as you wish, you know, and you'll have your ingredients, you'll have maybe your partner, maybe, maybe you're on your own, but it's your time to connect. Mm. And then, um, yeah, looping music into it is really, is, is, is again, another, another way to like stay focused and connected. And then obviously the cooking, uh, mm-hmm. that's where, you know, you get the reward is you get to have something delicious at the end of it. So that is, so we're doing an eight minute piece. It's a, their, their recipes are for home cooks. And we'll have a recipe on our site that you can get before it starts. And we're going to air those. uh, Actually, we start December 16th, the first, the first one will be released. Yeah. Well, when people, that's the same day that people can listen to this podcast. So so as soon as you hear this, you can go and get in the cooking space. (laughs) That's right. You can go on uh, chefgarces.com and all of the, all the details will be there. And so, Along with that, we're also going to be doing a live virtual class that's called Latin Live, and that's going to be available on the site as well. Go on there, plug in. So I'll have more, um, obviously, live and recorded is a whole different feel. And so uh, we'll be publishing the recipe as well ahead of time. Again, it's a cook along. So Eric, I expect you to be at the first one. I am. I'm going to be there. We're we're all going to be there. <laughs> and it's also, and and what I love about that is, um, 
you know, because of the, the power of the, of the internet, we'll be able to explore and, and let a lot of people access this, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I have some fans in South America and Venezuela and Colombia and Ecuador. I'm hopeful that we can connect with, with those folks as well, as well as uh, people nationally. So I'm really excited uh, about Latin Live. And then on, on our site, we're also doing some like, uh, service work, consulting services, something that I've, uh, you know, I can, I've been creating menus and concepts and helping yeah. people with F and B food and beverage solutions for years. So that's also an aspect of, of the site. So it's all encompassing all these, these cool things. Um, I also partnered with a, a wine company, uh, JCB wines, okay. uh, John Charles Boisset, they have wineries in Napa and in France. And I love hmm. their, I love all of their, their aspects. So, you know, again, food and wine, they just, obviously they match up really mm -hmm. nicely together. So it's a, you know, a culinary like paradise, I would say of like services, goods, content, all of it right there. Oh. This, this sounds amazing. So is all of this, or at least most of it found on your website? It's all found on the website. If you go to chefgarces.com and you have to put it in the, definitely put it in the browser, not in the Google search. So chefgarces.com, you'll be able to see it. And uh, yeah, it's also, it links up to the, the restaurants that we have. So again, we expect that hopefully uh, when things calm down, people get vaccinated and it's safe again, we'll be able to serve food in our, in our restaurants as well. Awesome. And so this, this moment of kind of going from a restaurateur, we're still maintaining all of that stuff, but then now having your own personal brand that people can get to know you, but also get to know your recipes, get to know how you cook, get to know your mindset, your methodology behind cooking. That really for you is your 180 is kind of framing your personal brand and being able to share, share with folks who you are. Yeah, exactly. All right. Share, connect, uh, you know, like really uh, talk food. I'm really excited about it. I think it's, you know, when you can, when you can really focus on it, it I, I just think it's going to be really special. And uh, yeah, it's been, it's been my 180 for sure. And it's, <laughs> it's like, they say timing is everything. It really, it really has been timing. Uh, while again, this has been a really unfortunate time for a lot of people in our industry and in the world and mm -hmm. uh, general, it's, it's been really uh, a, a tough period. Um, I feel like, you know, I'm an optimist. I'm someone who's always looking forward, looking at the brighter side of things. Yeah. And when, when I, realized that we were in this situation i think it was you know again it was it was time for my 180 to really think about things differently and with that in mind uh what have you learned like who were you before this moment and who do you uh who are you now who were you before this moment and who are you now wow well i'll say this you know i've, I've always uh you know i i think that with time and with with experience um you evolve and you have to evolve and i've had certainly some really highlights in my career and then some really humbling experiences as well some some tough times you know in business it, it you know it really can be can be challenging from time to time mm -hmm. um so i think you know i've been through this whole cycle of um call it career and business that have taught me to be just more appreciative of what I have and, you know, family and, you know, the simple things in life, you know, a good meal mm -hmm. and just has given me a lot of perspective on um, appreciating what we have, you know, and not always, not always, you know, trying to, you know, shoot for the moon or, or you know, or, or really, mm -hmm. you know, uh, be, you know, be less materialistic, more again yeah. about like, you know, are these, kind of organic experiences with friends and family. And now, you know, through the site, I'll be able to connect with people a little bit more and just share uh, some of my passion for, for food. So I feel like I've become a little more like, maybe a little more present, maybe yes. a little more like conscious, right? Uh -huh. And so that's, that's been my evolution, I think. 
Awesome. And, and um, as you were talking about, it, I was like, yeah, being more present. And, and that's something that a few guests that I've had uh, have talked about, have discussed is the ability to be within the present moment and not uh, always looking towards what's the next thing? How can I get more? Uh, or looking backwards and, you know, whether that's regret, whether that's staying in the past, but really being present and being grateful for the moment that we have. Um, but yeah, that, that's a powerful, message. powerful message. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. And uh, so I want to talk about food insecurity a little bit because it's definitely a serious issue, especially with communities of color. Um, yeah. not, not having access to healthy food options is costing people lives. And in an earlier episode of the 180, we had Tony Hillary, who's the founder of Harlem Grown, discuss how he addresses food insecurity in Harlem with various programs and community gardens. As a person that has a unique perspective and has been such a huge part of the culinary world, what do you think the culinary world can do to fight food insecurity? Yeah, so not only what can we do, I've actually, so I have, I have a foundation, the Garces Foundation, and we've, uh, we support the, the immigrant community in Philadelphia, mostly undocumented awesome. workers that work in, um, work in the industry. They work in, they work in restaurants, they work in construction. They're here, they're part of our community, mm -hmm. right? So we, we uh, several years ago decided to, you know, really help this, help this community through um, health and health, help provide health services. So we do community mm -hmm. health days that we test for, uh, uh, diabetes, cholesterol, general overall health checkups, dental screenings. And so incredible, um, yeah. we've been doing that. And then we also do, um, we've had this, uh, what we call it EREL program. So it's um, job force training and it's literacy through job force training. So mm -hmm. we have these kind of um, set up exercise to train people in restaurant work. And while they're doing it, they're learning English. And so awesome. we've had uh, about a hundred students per semester. We teach out of the, the South Philadelphia, uh, it's a South, South Philly, it's South work school. Um, mm -hmm. So we're in the community. And then when COVID happened, we started to, we realized that a lot of these folks were going to be out of work and we're not going to have the ability to support themselves. And so um, we started a food pantry program. And we started in the spring. We've actually delivered uh, about 7,000 boxes so far this, this year. And that's, that's 7,000 boxes. That's a, uh, each box is um, a meals for four people for a wow. while. So um, I'm really proud of that, that effort. And it just, it went to show us how, how much a demand there was yeah. for food. And not only, you know, beyond COVID, it's, it's there. Uh, we're still on a wait. And, you know, it's, it's a lot of hard work and a lot of effort to, like, get these programs going. We used to, we used to host, um, we hosted a big gala event, 700 people. That would be our largest. Wow. <laughs> that, would be our, that would be most of our budget for the year to do mm -hmm. all of our programs. About 75 to 80% of our budget was raised in one night. And actually, when when um, our event was slated for March 27th. Oh, so you okay. can imagine, yeah, right. that got canceled. Yeah. And so, um, so yeah, it's a lot of, we've got a great board, a great group of, um, call it um, members that uh, work, work the foundation. So yeah, it's, it's challenging, but to get back to your question about food in, in kind of the inner city and urban areas and fresh food, mm -hmm. I, I really do feel like there's, um, there's something even beyond what we're doing, which is, and, and I have a restaurant in West Philadelphia. It's, you know, predominantly it's, a, it's occupied mostly by the University, University of Pennsylvania, but it also has a very urban uh, component to it as well. It's a pretty expansive neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I, I was walking the neighborhood the other day and I just saw this like beautiful produce stand. It had like you know, tomatoes, bananas. It was like a beautiful little like, but it was like in the middle of a walkway, right? Uh -huh. It was like, um, but it was still kind of on the UPenn campus. So I thought, man, what a great way if, if we could just plop these like 
beautiful produce stands into like urban areas right. that are in need of like fresh food. Mm -hmm. And there are, uh, there are a lot of initiatives um, with ugly, I don't know if you ever heard of this term, ugly food, ugly fruit. It's, it's <laughs> no, fruit I have, that, I have not. Yeah, it's, it's food that farmers won't bring to market just because it doesn't have the perfect, it doesn't have the right shape. Oh, so, they up, okay. so they end up throwing it out, right? Uh -huh. Or end up, it ends up going into compost. So I just think there's a way, especially within our city of Philadelphia, that if we could pop up and it could even be on the honor system, right? Mm -hmm. Like you know, maybe very inexpensive, like, you know, 50 cents for an apple or you know, right. a quarter for a carrot, right? And it just, and everyone was able to access it in that way that, that really, you know, people that were in need were going to go there and get it. I think there's something there. So I've been thinking about it. I've been trying yeah. to put my, put my arms around maybe an initiative that works in that fashion. <laughs> we need, <laughs> we need more of that initiative and that creativity. So I, I love to hear that because as a, a storyteller and creative artist, um, I'm, I'm, I think about things through story most often, uh, but you know, the story that you just shared about access and about uh, how, how can we create a space where people um, can both give and receive something that they need and it can be actually accessible as opposed to, you know, behind the gatekeepers or really expensive or, um, but yeah, yeah we need more of that. Be, it has to be accessible. It has to be in the communities and, uh, and I think it's, I also think it's educational too, right? There's like an education component to it. It could, it could involve like easy recipes or like, you know, how do you take like, you know, you asked me about it. You asked me earlier how to iron out some stuff. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. So there is, I realize that there are challenges in, in call it, you know, in, in the community as far as just produce, like how do you take it and produce a quick meal for your right. family when you're working and you're doing everything else you mm -hmm. can to support it. So there's, there's an educational component of, to it as well, but I think it's, it should be done. I think it's like, we're way past, way overdue on some really like, uh, yeah, innovative initiatives to get people fresh food. Yeah. And in terms of your experience with your family uh, growing up, what were some uh, ways in which food brought you all together? What were some uh, of your most memorable moments with food and with your family? Yeah, you know, um, I spoke to you briefly about my mom and my grandma. They, they, were, they were awesome cooks and they were, uh, you know, they would make empanadas, mm. ceviches. Uh, my I mom was great. <laughs> yeah, my dad was like great on the grill. His steaks were always awesome. It's something I always look forward to like on the weekends. So yeah, cooking and and having family gatherings around food has always been part of part part of my life. So I have two I have two children too. Uh, they're teenagers now, seventeen and thirteen. But I make sure that we have all of our dinners together. Mm. That we have we break bread. We talk about the day. You know, anyone has beef, it comes out at the table. That's mm -hmm. fine. <laughs> but it's really about. Um, yeah, around a meal, and we all get excited about it. Especially like now during uh, during quarantine, I think I've been really looking to utilize my assets, which is I can I can make a good meal, so mm -hmm. to help lift their spirits, so that you know at the end of the day, if they're doing virtual school, they have yeah. something really good to look forward to. And so, um, yeah, I think I think it's so important. Uh, and again, when it I challenge you to get keep on cooking, buddy. All right, keep it going. Okay, <laughs> I, I love this. I mean, this is an inspiration. With uh, yeah, this is an inspiration. I'm gonna I'm gonna get cooking. I'm I'm definitely gonna be on that live class. That first one in January. <laughs> Got it. January sixth. Yeah. January sixth. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, so along with uh, all of the work that you've done, what's something that you're looking forward to? Is something next? Is there anything that you're thinking about right now? I mean, this this. Uh, this branding and this rollout of the new products and live cooking, that's really exciting. Is there anything that you're like, okay, and also I want to be president? <laughs> that's extreme, that's extreme. Well, also, uh, no, I mean, 
also, I'm also thinking about, okay, what is the future of our food industry? Yeah, How yeah. are people really, uh, you know, are restaurants going to be something that people go to, right? And so mm. uh, I've been really hot on uh, digital brands and ghost kitchens and that, and that sort of thing. So mm. I'm actually um, working on a few uh, creative solutions for that space as well, yeah. because I... Ultimately, I still like. I'm a chef. I love. I love uh, cooking and creating and getting our stuff. You know, our our hopefully our you know our delicious products to people. So there is a way. Mm -hmm. There is a path forward for our industry, and I want to be a trendsetter on that side of things as well. You you already are, but you'll become more and more, more of a trendsetter. Even more. Yeah. And uh, you you mentioned ghost kitchen, and I and I said I sat and I tried to wrap my mind around what that meant. So, what is a ghost kitchen? So, um, ghost kitchens are basically they're call it like spaces in which you can turn out food, but people aren't dining in. So, okay. and it's all it's all delivery based. So through through the delivery app system, which you could see is not going away anytime soon. Right, right. Uh, DoorDash just had a nice uh, IPO, I believe. Um, so yeah, it's that's that is where it's going, Eric. And that's, that's where, like a takeout only restaurant, a, a restaurant takeout that's or delivery, just takeout or delivery, takeout or delivery like, only. Takeout or delivery, and you would be surprised how efficient it is as an operator. Because when you open a restaurant, right, there are a lot of costs associated, a ton, quite a few. When you're just producing food, it's a little different. And so uh, this idea of like digital brands that are really, you know, just based on the web, you see, you know, you, there's a brand story. There are obviously delicious foods. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I think I think it's heading that way. want to. I'm going to jump on that wave. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, we usually wrap up the 180 with a quote. Um, and it's been, it's, I will tell you, it's been really inspiring to hear about your journey and also to hear about the next wave. And like you mentioned, a lot of careers within the pandemic, a lot of industries within the pandemic are shifting and having to adjust. And just to see how you're adjusting, um, but it's also very aligned with who you are, which um, that's another thing on the 180 we talk about is our authentic selves, our well-being, our wellness. And it sounds like everything that you're doing is aligned with that uh, in mind. So it's really, really exciting. Awesome, Eric. Yeah. I mean, I think to be successful, you got to do things that you love and are natural to you that feel that feel good. And again, after you know, being in this industry 25 years and have seen, I think, I think a lot. Um, I just want to do things that are, that are fun, that feel good, that uh, hopefully help humanity a little bit. And, and that's it. Do my part. Super. Uh, all right. So here's this quote. I just want to get your thoughts on this quote. One cannot think well, love well, sleep well, if one has not dined well. That's from Virginia Woolf. Got it. Got it. I know the quote. It's a good one. And yeah. that is true. That is true. And with that said, my turkey chili's on the stove. I'm really excited about that. <laughs> turkey chili. That sounds really good. I mean, and if you made it, I know it's good. So <laughs> it was, you know, I made it last night for my wife and she was like, Jose, why haven't we had this before? I'm like, I don't know. We just, I just was like, let's make chili tonight. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, you know, uh, I'm, I'm just a, like an hour and a half away from Philly. So if you want to save some, I can try to, I can try to make it before it gets too cold. I already got some in the freezer for you. It's great. You come, we'll just, we'll reheat. I promise you won't even tell. You'll even know. It's like, oh, this is great. So my man, Jose, I love it. I love it. Okay. We're going pleasure. to be cooking together in no time. All right. Yeah. <laughs> relatively soon. I'm going to look out for you. <laughs> all right. Well, everybody, I want to make sure that you all stay connected with Chef Jose. So um, you can find him on Instagram at Chef Jose Garces. Garces is G-A-R-C-E-S. Um, and, and you can find him on Twitter at Jose Garces Official. 
So make sure you stay connected with him and go to that website and check out all that he's got going on. It's chefgarces.com, chef, G-A-R-C-E-S.com. So make sure you check him out and join me on January 6th for that first class. And you might see me as a few others because I definitely need them. <laughs> well, I'm going to get better. The Chef Jose is going to help me. We're going we're gonna to give me a 180 in the kitchen. We're going to do that. We're gonna do that. We're gonna come back next year and be like, "Oh, chef, I made this amazing uh, pot pie, whatever." And uh, hey, yes, <laughs> something because yeah, pot pie. I I I don't bake anything, so it, yeah, <laughs> that would certainly be an achievement. I got uh, some, I got some good tips for you. I got I, I I know exactly where you're at. Yeah, and I know what we can do. I'll just I'll just leave it at that. Okay, I appreciate because if I could have a personal cooking chef uh if i could have a personal cooking coach man uh, you know nobody would be able to tell me anything once i get good in the kitchen that's right won't that's be able right. to tell me nothing <laughs> well thank you so much is there anything else that you wanted to share with us jose and it's been a pleasure thank you for having me it's been fun chatting with you and hanging out and uh until next time buen provecho salute salute <laughs>